call to order the May 23rd, 2017 meeting of the City Council of the City of Fredericksburg. We will be led in invocation by Councilor Bradford Ellis, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance to the Flag. Please stand if you wish. Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity you have given us to serve. Keep us, keep us ever mindful of those in need and watch over those protecting our way of life and our freedom. In your name we pray. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Officer Worley, for being with us this evening. We have uh, three public hearings before us. I will call upon our clerk to read item 5A. Amending the fares charge for the Fredericksburg Regional Transit System. Uh, Mr. Craig Reed. Thank you and good evening. Um, Fred Transit each year uh, does a review of our fare structure and our review is really all about uh, creating and maintaining a balance in value. And the value is sometimes uh, competing. Uh, value for the customer would be keeping the rates as absolutely low as possible. And value for the jurisdictions that help fund Fred Transit would be uh, ensuring that the fare structure is such that we recover a reasonable amount of money to help contribute to the operating costs. Uh, this year, uh, we took a look at many different options, including not raising the fares at all, but then we also took a look at increasing the price of a single fare pass, uh, either 25 cents or 50 cents, uh, single fares, uh, increasing passes by either $5 or a $10 amount, and then we looked at all combinations of those. So we looked at increasing only fares, increasing only passes, uh, doing a high increase in fare, a low increase in passes. Uh, you get the idea, all of the combinations. After a, a lot of uh, discussion with our advisory board, uh, what we have recommended was an increase in fares, uh, the single fares of 25 cents, and an increase in the uh, monthly passes of $50. Uh, we believe that these increases are uh, both justified and fair, as, as, we, as I discussed. Uh, first of all, the last fare increases for uh, VRE single fare was in July 2011. Uh, the last increase in the regular service fare was in uh, July of 2013. Uh, more recently, uh, passes, the, the VRE service increased in July of 14, and the regular service pass was increased in July of 15. Most recently, this last year, uh, we extended our half fare program to all hours of operations, which really amounts to a fare reduction to uh, the senior citizens and uh, permanently and temporarily disabled uh, persons. On the other side of that coin, uh, we believe it's fair to the, uh, to the funding uh, jurisdictions. Uh, if we are granted this increase, uh, it will generate an additional uh, estimated $80,000 in fair revenues, which goes to help to defray the costs that are paid by the counties and the city. And we also, we chose the, uh, the 25 cent, the low single fare increase and the higher pass increase because we believe that was more fair to our customers. When we look at ridership trends, uh, generally about two-thirds of the trips taken on Fred are through single fares. So by making a lower increase into the single fares, uh, we were impacting um, the ridership uh, to a less extent. And finally, in closing, uh, prior to this hearing, uh, we only le received one letter. Uh, it was from a few residents from the Enoch George uh, residential facility. Uh, these folks suggested that they would rather not understandably see the fares raise. Uh, we did get back to them and respond that notifying them of our half fare program and the opportunity to participate in that. So with that, I'll close and uh, entertain any questions or comments you might have. 
Thank you. Does anyone have a, a question for Mr. Reed? Thank you, uh, Councilor Kelly. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, I'm going to kind of look, step back and take a bigger picture look at where Fred is and, and the situation in the coming years, seeing that we are looking at a fair increase. Uh, the Vice Mayor and I serve both on the VRE and PRTC boards, which are PRTCs looking at roughly a $9 million deficit going into the following year. VRE is having its issues. Uh, Department of Rail and Public Transportation just put out a notice, and I'm assuming you all received it, uh, establishing a task force to meet with transit agencies to discuss trying to find other funding sources beyond the traditional state funding sources because frankly they're drying up and are going down in the, in the coming years. So I guess my first question is you're looking at an increase now and it's roughly 83. I know what your general budget is. Are you guys basically facing these? Again, I don't know. I'm not obviously on the board, but I'm assuming you guys are fa facing the same stresses that other transit organizations are. And do uh, you want to make a prediction of where we're going to be in the next year or two with <laughs> knowing what's coming down the pike? Uh, boy, I wish I could say. I, I, we're aware of, um, you know, what's going on at the state level. Uh, we're currently in the process with the assistance of a consultant developing a uh, transit development plan, which takes a look out six years into the future. Uh, we believe that we're positioned well and that we would be able to make um, any adjustments that we would need to uh, to, uh, to address whatever changes comes along at the state. Uh, we, we currently are not up at our 50% level of funds that we receive from the feds, and so we have a little wiggle room there. And then plus, we've done a very, very good job in the last couple of years of really managing and closing down on our cost side of the balance sheet. So. I think we're positioned well, and, and uh, we'll just have to wait and see what the state determines. Okay. I'm glad to hear that you guys are working on a six-year plan, because that was kind of coming into my next two questions, which is looking at our budget for FRED and looking at the percentage of funds you receive as a result of fares, which for the people I'm not here who want to talk on this issue, just to give you a heads up, I think right now you're trying to get to 12% of fair revenue return. Uh, VRE is required. I mean, it's federal law that we have to, 50% of ours has to be covered by fares. And I'm being PRTC has a similar range. So uh, it should be pointed out that you guys are getting a lot of good support from other organizations and stuff that are helping out which frankly VRE and PRTC does not have with the university and some of the other jurisdictions. But I noticed that the amount of monies from fares has been either flat or gone down a little bit. Does that signify ridership being flat or going down in the last few years? Yes, in the last four years, um, ridership has declined. And it's not only in FRED Transit, but this is pretty much universal across the Commonwealth of Virginia and nationwide. There are few transit agencies that have seen any kind of an increase in the last couple of years in ridership. So, uh, so are there any long-term, looking at the plans, and again, have gone through the planning process, long-term planning process for PRTC and VRE, are you looking at any future expansion in services or taking FRED to another level? <clears throat> yeah, we have in our transit development plan, we have been in contact and working closely with FAMPO and uh, George Washington Regional Commission in trying to dovetail with them with their long-range transportation planning and uh, looking at what they're trying to do uh, to, to address congestion in the area along with uh, the needed highway improvements to expand capacity. So we're working very closely with them to uh, to be a partner and play a role in the total transportation picture in the next uh, several years. Any plans up to this point of expanding services anywhere in the counties? So the counties come up with any requests for additional services? I know we've reduced services in some of the counties, but are we getting any requests to increase services? No, we have not gotten any requests to uh, increase service. Um, we, we meet regularly with the county administrators and Spotsylvania in particular with the number of residential developments and housing units that have been approved 
in the last couple of years, uh, I could foresee that there would be a need to do some expansions of service in Spotsylvania County uh, for sure, or you're, you're going to just compound the, uh, the, the traffic congestion situation. Uh, but again, that's that's probably as far as I should go with my crystal ball. Okay. And uh, <clears throat> last but not least, uh, both PRTC and VRE both have programs in place with regards to their bu respective budgets where it's pretty much planned out the increase in costs and how they're going to be borne out. VRE, at one year, it's going to be roughly a 3% increase to localities, contributions. The next year's a three-year fare increase. PRTC is a little, not quite that rigid, but it has pretty good telling the public, you know what, in the next few years you can look at this kind of increase. Do you guys have any projections on, I mean, we're looking at 25 cents tonight, and I'll wait for the public to comment, and I've got some few more comments to make, uh, on what the situation is going to be with fares in the future. Um, no, I, and Wendy, I don't know if uh, Wendy, our director, has any. I don't. I don't really have a good crystal ball for fares in the future. Historically, uh, we have never raised fares two years in a row. Uh, we've always gone at least two years, and as you heard in my earlier comments, uh, we've actually gone uh, since 2011, since we've increased VRE fares. Uh, we've, we've done a lot, like I said, in the last couple of years to really tighten up our budget, and we've tried to hold the funding request request to the jurisdictions at pretty close to level. Um, I think we've probably squeezed as much as we can out of that, and uh, you know we'll continue to try to hold the line. Uh, but as long as uh, gas prices stay the way they are, uh, we don't see any huge spikes in that. Um, we we should be okay. All right, thank you, <clears throat> Council Fry. Thank you, Mayor Greenwell. Um, I just have a comment, and I want to just to take a, a, a minute since we're talking about Fred um, about the the services that uh, that Fred uh, does in the community. And I'm out and about a lot in the area, and um, I just want to just say thank you to to you all and um, and especially your employees um, because you know the, the fares are low, but the service is like is like top notch and uh, I don't I don't ride the Fred um but um I see what they do and I just I want to throw out a quick example real quick um I see a few times a week near the YMCA at the YMCA uh one of your drivers uh helps someone in a wheelchair and some some days it's raining and and everything and uh your employees uh always seem with a smile on their face and very helpful and I I mean it, it really makes a big difference and it, it feels good you know to see Fredericksburg name one side of of that transit, you know, uh, you know, helping out folks like that, and it's, it's it's a big impact. So you know, we never know when we're going to need it, for doctors' appointments, and so on and so forth. But I just wanted to branch off a little bit and say thank you all. No, thank you. Appreciate that. And uh, we don't only sort of stay within our box. We uh, when we consider fare changes, uh, we look outside the box, and we have about 15 other transit agencies in Virginia and Maryland that are of similar size and nature to Fred Transit, and we take a look at them and how they're pricing. And even with the 25 cent increase that we're proposing, there are still 11 of those 15 transit agencies that charge higher fares than we do. So we really, really try very hard to be fair to the customer and, as I said, to the funding jurisdictions to try to keep um, a real good balance. Um, Wendy also whispered to me and during the break, if, if you all haven't already heard, um, we've gotten some word from Caroline County that although in their budgeting process they've, they've budgeted money to fund us for the coming fiscal year that will start in July, they are looking at and considering uh, reductions in service and possibly elimination of service in Caroline County. <laughs> So we will be attending a, a public hearing with them on uh, June 13th uh, to see how that fleshes out. Um, thank you, Mr. Craig. Uh, this is, <coughs> excuse me, this is a public hearing. Uh, anyone who is here who wishes to speak to this item may approach the microphone, give your name and address for purposes of the record, and please 
for, to be fair to everyone, observe the five-minute time limit and yield the floor when the clerk indicates your time is up. There's actually a little device here with a green and yellow and red button on it. And the yellow button will come on when you're getting close, so that kind of helps you out, too. Um, but this is a public hearing, and anyone who is here who would like to speak to this matter, please do so. Just approach the podium. Mm -hmm. For sure. <clears throat> um, Make sure the green light is on on the uh, microphone. Uh -huh. You uh -huh. might have to push the button on the microphone. It's yeah. on? Okay. Thank you. Jack McDonald from Spotsylvania, Virginia. I've been with Fred like five years. Um, Fred's vehicles are constantly breaking down. Um, hand the handicapped uh, equipment for Fred drivers makes it quite um, impossible for them to stay on schedule. I think you should have special Fred vehicles pick up the handicapped people. Um, Comparison, uh, Charlottesville, Virginia, vehicles are not, are smaller, more common to ride than Fred. Fred has far to go from Charlottesville of vehicles. Size of vehicles, uh, uh, of vehicles make them hard to maneuver and make them uh, hard to stay on schedule. Uh, Pioneer hearings like this should be held more often. Um, concerning, um, and like uh, other localities, like Spotsylvania, King George, Stafford. Uh, shelters are far, far from being built in, uh, in this area. Uh, why is not uh, Fred meeting with board supervisors to urge them to build shelters? Uh, I can't, make, can't believe why shelters are not being built. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you much. Thank you, Mr. McDonald. McNutt, thank you. Thank you. Um, is there anyone else who would like to speak? All right, if there's no one else who wishes to speak to the matter of the um, raising of the amending the fares for Fred Bus System, then we will declare this public hearing closed. This is a matter before us for first read. Madam Mayor, I'll move to approve the ordinance on first read, amending the fares charged for the Fredericksburg Regional Transit System. Second. Motion's been made and seconded. Mr. Kelly. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, the questions I asked were not, shouldn't be taken anything other than placing the reality of what transit faces right now in the Commonwealth of Virginia. Um, I would really like to see when the six year planning process is completed, that we do have a sit-down chat between the council and the transit board. Uh, you're right, we are talking about transit at the GWRC FAMFO level. The issue we have, and we started this five or six years ago when we went to the 2035 planning, we looked at transit and the problem is the way we're developing, which is a more suburban development pattern, it makes it very difficult to make transit viable except Route 3, Route 1, and those. So the other issue is I know a lot of people who do not have vehicles of their own need to get to work, doctors and shopping, and are a large part of the clientele for Fred. And if that is the goal we want for Fred, then we might be having a discussion at some point of do we frankly increase our funding to it as an option, as opposed to continually passing a cost on to a part of our community that frankly every, every dollar counts. Um, or are we talking about, as you guys move forward, the expansion of the service into other areas and other aspects of transit? Um, we know that if we want to take transit to the level of people getting out of their cars, that's going to, frankly, at this point in the ball game, is a cost that we can't even come close to making. You've got to guarantee somebody being picked up 15 minutes when they step out the door to get on a bus and get back in a reasonable amount of time which would cause a massive expansion, and I don't think we're there yet. The counties, as you have noted with Caroline, have been paring back their services. But I think it is an important service to have for the community. It helps a part of the community that needs that assistance. 
Uh, but if it comes down to it, I would like us to have one, understand where you all are going, and two, have the conversation of if, if this is the level of service we're going to do and we know what the target community is, I know we're also doing VRE riders, which is a great thing to do too, uh, then we might want to have a serious discussion of, of what the costs should be to the riders. Uh, but I will support the motion because I do understand what you're trying to do and I understand that, you, frankly, compared to what's going on at PRTC and VRE, <laughs> you're in a lot better shape than most, actually. Uh, but I think it's time for us to really sit down when you guys finish that plan and have a serious discussion of where we are going to take Fred in the future. Thank you. Vice Mayor Weathers. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, and this, I don't know whether Mr. Foss should an or can answer this uh, or you all, uh, but the uh, the uh, bus uh, stop uh, canopies, uh, are they uh, done by the FRED or are they done by the localities? Uh, does that come out of transportation funds uh, of, of the localities or does FRED pay for that? Well, it's a joint effort. The most recent one was where, where the funding for the shelters is provided by FRED and the Public Works Department uh, poured the pads and, and so forth. So uh, it's a joint effort of, of the Public Works Department and of FRED. But as far as providing the funds for the purchase of the shelters, that does come through FRED funds. Okay. So if, if, if someone wanted to request that, they probably could request it through the locality and then work with FRED if, if, if they could do that. Is that right? Yes. Okay, good. Yes. Thank you. That might be helpful. Yes, Councilor Kelly. Uh, Madam Mayor, I can, I can tell you that in, in the case of Stafford County, who gets a small smidgen of the WMATA funds, which is the Northern Virginia Transit funds, uh, that's what they have used their funding for in the past is, is to build shelter. So most of the shelter operation aspect of this is probably going to be a, a conversation more at the, at the jurisdictional level than it's going to be at the FRED level, frankly. Yeah, if I may clarify, the, the, the shelters that I was referring to most recently installed were the shelters in the city itself. Any further comment on this motion? Please cast your votes. Motion passes 7-0. Right. Thank you, Mr. Ree and Ms. Kimball. Item 5B, Madam Clerk, will you please read? Approving the preliminary subdivision plat for Telegraph Hill, approximately 29 acres of single-family residential development with associated access and infrastructure improvements. Thank you. I will call upon Ms. Sherman. Thank you. Can I please have the computer? Thank you. As the clerk just read, the total site comprises approximately 29 acres. Um, but 20 acres is owned R4 and is the primary focus of the application tonight. The, applica the applicant proposes to develop the 20 acres into 80 single family clustered lots. The site is located on the west side of Lafayette Boulevard, south of Blue Gray Parkway and Allen Springs Road, across from the Fredericksburg National Battlefield National Park, uh, nearby to residences on St. Paul Street and within the Kensington subdivision. Alum Springs Road and the Virginia Central Railway, the VCR Trail, form the western and northern boundaries. Again, the applicant proposes to subdivide about 20 acres into 80 single-family detached lots and open space parcels. That's shown in blue on your screen here in front of you. Uh, there will be an additional subdivision of two large parcels. They're known as parcels A and parcel A1. That's uh, within the PDMU, the planned development mixed use portion of the Fredericksburg Park project. Uh, and they're just kind of subdivided when the Rampart Drive connection is made. They're not part of this application formally. At build out, the 80 single family lots will be served by two public streets from Lafayette Boulevard. Rampart Drive will serve as the main access to the neighborhood and connect to the proposed roundabout, which is to be constructed with the Fredericksburg Park mixed-use development. That's shown on the right side of your screen further north, further closer to Blue Gray Parkway. City View Lane provides a secondary right-in, right-out connection to Lafayette Boulevard at the southern end of the project. That's shown in the smaller circle at the bottom of your screen. City View Lane will also connect to Alum Springs Road at its northern end, shown at the top of your screen. Oops. All internal streets are designed with curb gutter and five-foot sidewalks. The 10-foot wide VCR trail will be constructed along Lafayette Boulevard 
per the Lafayette Boulevard design guidelines. Over five acres of land will be dedicated to the Homeowners Association for open space set aside, set aside as required by the code. The open space is designated for active and pa passive recreational uses, as well as a portion of the stormwater facilities. Three pocket parks are located throughout the development and will be improved with sidewalk connections, mailboxes, landscaping, and benches, and serve as community meeting places. A graded field is shown on the south side of Rampart Drive adjacent to lot 42, which will provide for open play. Two trail connections from the subdivision to the VCR trail are proposed adjacent to lots 21 and 22, and at the new intersection of City View Lane to Allen Springs Road. A type B buffer will be provided between the project and the PDM zone portion of Fredericksburg Park. There will be one stormwater management pond located here along Allen Springs Road and within the Dominion Power easement. Again, I've been working with Dominion Power to make sure that they um, are aware of this and, and that Garrett Development, the, or the applicant, has all of the required approvals from them, uh, which was subject, which is something we'll be looking at with the construction plan subject to your approval of this application. The applicant proposes to develop the project in two phases. Phase one is shown in the pinkish color and comprises almost five and a half acres uh, for the development of 22 lots off the southern access to Lafayette Boulevard. Phase two is shown in blue and comprises the remaining 58 lots. Phase one includes its proportionate share of open space as required by the code and one pocket park that will have sidewalk access, landscape benches, and a community mailbox. For phase one, the entrance at City View Lane will, will provide the sole access to the 22 lots. City View Lane will serve all 22 lots and will temporarily end at the future intersections with Rampart Drive and Headquarters Way. The proposed entrance at Lafayette Boulevard is designed to accommodate a right, right and left turn movements to and from Lafayette Boulevard. The associated improvements include a 100-foot right turn lane and a 100-foot taper southbound, which is going up the hill towards Kensington subdivision, and a 125-foot left turn lane with a 200-foot taper northbound going down the hill toward Blue Gray Parkway. Phase two comprises, again, the remaining 58 lots in open space. Uh, with, with the approval of the recordation, or excuse me, prior to the approval and recordation of the final subdivision plat for phase two, um, the applicant has acknowledged that they will um, have the Lafayette Boulevard road improvement plans approved. That includes the roundabout and additional improvements along Lafayette Boulevard. Additionally, they will submit all of their performance guarantees required for the construction of those improvements. They've also acknowledged that prior to the city issuing any certificate of occupancy for any lot in phase two, uh, they will, prior to that, they will have the connection of Rampart Drive made to the roundabout. Oh, I should also point out with phase two, the entrance that was originally serving phase one will be converted to a right in, right out only. The slide talks about the connection to the Hubbard Hellman tract. Uh, our code requires that every street within a subdivision be designed to provide access to adjacent acreage unless not determined necessary by city council for minor and major subdivisions. This is a major subdivision and so you all will be acting on this. The adjacent property is zoned R4. It's shown uh, where that blue square is. It's a, it's a triangular piece. It's about two acres and it's zoned R4. Uh, it has limited access via an easement over Alum Springs Road uh, adjacent and parallel to the VCR trail. It's currently developed with one single family residence. The applicant requests relief from this requirement to provide direct public street access from City View Lane to the property due to the limited potential to further subdivide the property. There's a steep grade and there's substantial cost to extending a street onto that property to serve any additional units. Based on staff's initial review of the request, the applicant added a 17 to 19 foot wide private access easements between lots 16 and 17, as shown here in blue, uh, to this neighboring property instead of providing the public street connection. The easement will be graded with a curb cut installed at City View Lane to allow for future installation by the property owner of the Hubbard Hellman tract. Um, they can install a driveway at their own choosing uh, at a later date. I did want to point out that a representative for this property owner attended the Planning Commission meeting and, and did speak. They did not have any objection to the proposal as shown. 
Staff does recommend, it, recommend that City Council approve the proposed private access easement to meet the intent of the code as it provides improved access from a public street uh, to this property, very similar to a pipe stem lot. The Planning Commission did act on May 10th and voted, rec and voted to recommend approval of the application with the private access easement as shown to the hubbard Hellman tract. There were two other conditions regarding the connection of City View Lane to Lafayette Boulevard and City View Lane to Alum Springs Road. Both of those conditions have been addressed with the current application dated May 16th that was included in your package. Therefore, staff recommends that City Council approve the attached resolution approving the application uh, subject to approval of the proposed private access easement to the hubbard Hellman tract to satisfy the city code. I'll be happy to answer any questions that you may have, and I did want to point out that Justin Troidel of Bowman Consulting is here representing the owner, and he is also available to answer any of your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sherman. Councilor Kelly. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Marty, first question would be, that this project as it has now been proposed is within the bounds of the original agreement between the city and the developer for this particular project. Is that correct? We're not asking for anything above and beyond what we had already discussed, what, two years ago? <laughs> Three years ago. Right. It, it is a different application, uh, but it complies with all of the codes and it's generally consistent with the previous application you approved. All right. And the second question I want to just elaborate a little bit more on. You said the roundabout and other improvements. The other improvements include the widening of Lafayette Boulevard, the inclusion of the trails and pedestrian access up to the top of the hill uh, and widening all the way up to the top of the hill it's a, and turn lanes necessary, etc. Yes. Correct. The only thing that's not included in this phase would be the re relining Allen Springs, which I'd uh, love to have done sooner rather than later, but that will become later. But everything else will be part of this project. Let me clarify that. The road plans that we have in uh, would improve Lafayette Boulevard from essentially St. Paul Street to the roundabout. And then there'll be limited improvements to the existing access point with Alum Springs Road. Okay. The, the agreement that council agreed to with the developer um, delegated the Lafayette imp improvements. Uh, it, it, it would evolve as the commercial pieces, the different land bays evolved. All right. Thank you. Are there any other questions from Ms. Sherman? This is a public hearing. Is there anyone here who would like to speak to this matter? Then we will declare the public hearing closed. This is a resolution requiring one vote. Madam Mayor, I'll move approving the preliminary subdivision plat for Telegraph Hill, approximately 29 acres of single family residential development with associated access and infrastructure improvements. Motion's been made and seconded. Uh, Councilor Devine. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I just wanted to um, reiterate some of the concerns I had during our work session. And I, I do have concerns about this development as far as the, um, while it meets our ordinance, I um, am not a big fan of the narrower streets that only allow parking on one side of them. I think that sometimes causes tension in a neighborhood. I, I realize that the homes do have garages and driveways, but, um, you know, people do have guests and things. I think it's a, it, it's, it creates something that is unnecessary. I think the narrow streets don't really lend themselves to the community feel of neighborhoods. Um, and I was surprised to learn that the postal service will not be delivering door to door. Um, and so that it, it kind of changes the tone of a neighborhood as well. So um, those are concerns I have about this project. I'm going to go ahead and vote for it. It c does comply with our ordinances. Um, but I, I wish that was different. So thank you. Council Kelly. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, this has been a, a bit of a long process getting to this point of getting the project moving forward. Uh, I know there's a lot of concern, especially along the Lafayette Boulevard corridor, and, and frankly, rightfully so, uh, with regards to the intensity of this development. Um, I want to make it clear that in all discussions the city had in working with the, the, the development community on this project, I know there's been people coming in and out of this project. Um, but one, it's land, it is going to be developed. The question is how intense it's going to be developed, and does it at least help us along with some of the improvements that we need to make? 
and for me and the National Park Service, the protection of a huge asset to the city, which is the battlefields. And in the course of the conversation, uh, we did get a reduction, basically it was, was, involves a reduction in, in the amount of density in the development. Um, it involves, of course, the developer paying for the improvements to Lafayette Boulevard in front of their project to include, I know the roundabout is a bit controversial, but it's better than a traffic light going downhill. And we did ask that it be designed to meet future traffic needs, which it does. And we've run that through. And the Park Service has been involved with and is ensuring the landscaping will be done to screen the project. So everything that the city could do in understanding that this land was going to be developed has been done. And we also want to thank the National Park Service for their involvement in all these conversations. And, and we did partner with them uh, to make sure that this project was something that um, minimizes its impact on the battlefield. Uh, and again, I said it at the beginning and I'll say it again, yes, with the level of development here and some of the other projects we're looking at in and around the Lafayette Boulevard <coughs> corridor coming forward to us, uh, the, this city and the council has a lot of work to do uh, to deal with the, the traffic issues <coughs> that are coming up. I mean, we've already have issues with Blue Green Parkway coming onto Lafayette Boulevard that we have to deal with as well as thinking about the development going on 2 and 17, which is going to create even more stress, and that's, of course, Spotsylvania County uh, sticking it to us in a, in a sense uh, in that process. Well, we've got a lot of work to do uh, on the transportation front to make, make all this work, but I do thank uh, the development community for stepping up and making some significant improvements to Lafayette Boulevard uh, to bring this project forward and their ability and, and being a, working with the National Park Service to minimize its impact on the battlefields. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Fry. Thank you, Mayor Greenlaw. I just want to throw a comment out there um, <coughs> about this phase here. Um, I just want to say I'm, I'm happy to see uh, some single family homes. We live in, 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 in the world of the city of Fredericksburg where everybody um, comes to the table and tells us how great apartments and townhouses are and how they're the best thing for this location on every piece of property that pretty much just crosses our table. But I just wanted to say it's, it's good to see, uh, you know, a project with a piece of property like other pieces of property in the city um, where there's going to be some single family homes. Um, no matter what the future holds on other pieces of property, at least this one here, um, we have finally some single family homes. Um, so I just want to throw that out there. Yes, Councilor Duffy. Thank you, Mayor. I would just like to... Um, say that I agree with everything my colleagues have said about, you know, it's going to be a little different kind of neighborhood with a one-sided parking and and, um, and the, the post, post boxes the way they are. Uh, but also, uh, you know, I hope that this is the beginning of real improvements to the Lafayette uh, Boulevard corridor. I, I'm concerned about that, um, both for vehicles and for pedestrians. And, um, and I'm, I'm pleased that there's um, s some limit to what this uh, development could be. It could be more dense um, on this site. So I, I think this is making the best of it. And of course, all of this was negotiated many years ago before my time here. Uh, but I'm uh, happy to support it. Thank you. Thank you. Motion's been made and seconded. Please cast your votes. Motion passes 7-0. Okay. Madam Clerk, would you please read item 5C? Conveying the city's interest in the 11.703 acre portion of GPINS 7778-07-4650 and 7768-866689, more commonly known as stormwater Stormwater pod, Ponds 1, 2, 3, and 4 to Catalanic Group Incorporated, accepting the dedication in, of Catalanic Group Incorporated's interest in an approximately 54.2 acre portion of GPENS 7779-00-3066 and 77. 78-18-7467 to establish a new public area and entering into a trail maintenance agreement with Catalanic Group Incorporated. Thank you. Ms. Sherman? Thank you. May I have the computer, please? Just a minute. Oh, 
I'll get started. Uh, the properties that will soon be shown on your screen are located in planning area three of the city uh, on the north and south sides of Idlewild Boulevard, west of Landrum's Retreat, and our zone plan development residential. There you go. Uh, areas one and two were established with the subdivision of the Village of Idlewild Phase Three in 2006 and are currently held by Cal Atlantic Group, Inc. The acreage includes preserved open space that protects the northern branch of Hazel Run. It also includes nature trails that connect the city's extensive network of trails and sidewalks, three stormwater facilities known as ponds five through seven, and tree buffer areas. Parcels for ponds one through four, which are subject to this application, will be created with the recordation of, of the subdivision plat, which was included in your package. These ponds are located in areas three and four, as shown on the slide, on the south side of Idlewild Boulevard. Area 3 was accepted by the city in 2005 and contains ponds 3 and 4. Area 4 was accepted by the city in 2004 and contains ponds 1 and 2. The Village of Idlewild was developed following approval of a conditional rezoning in 2003. Proffer number 2 states in part that the applicant agrees to dedicate to the city in fee simple approximately 151 acres of the property. and. Um, this was dependent upon the city's desire to own and maintain such land. Any portion of the dedicated area that the city does not desire to be dedicated shall be deeded to and maintained by the HOA. What we're asking you tonight is to consider acceptance of this property. Additionally, Proffer 2 states that or requires the developer to construct a soft bedded nature trail within the dedicated area uh, and that the HOA shall maintain this unless accepted by the city. There was also proffer number 15, which required the applicant to construct all necessary on-site stormwater management ponds and said that those ponds shall be owned and maintained by the HOA unless determined by the city. Areas one and two, again as shown on your screen, less than except the stormwater ponds and tree buffer areas comprise the balance of the 151 acres of land envisioned by proffer number two. The required nature trails have been constructed within each of the four areas and are currently maintained by the Village of Idlewild's Homer, Homeowners Association. The city has maintained the ponds one through four, which again on, are on areas three and four, uh, since the property was conveyed to the city by Cal Atlantic Group. Um, Cal Atlantic has maintained ponds five through seven on its property since they were constructed. However, long-term maintenance of all of the ponds was intended to be the responsibility of the HOA in accordance with Proffer 15. In 2015, Michael Craig, uh, the zoning administrator, issued an order to remedy compliance with the proffered conditions, which included the transfer of areas 1 and 2 from Cal Atlantic to the city, pursuant to Proffer 2, and the transfer of ponds 1 through 4 from the city to Cal Atlantic, pursuant to Proffer 15, subject to the review by the Planning Commission and the City Council. The order was issued following consultation with and concurrence by various city departments, the Pathways Steering Committee, and the city manager at the time, who all agreed that the city should accept the open space land and transfer of ownerships of ponds one through four, again, subject to your approval. The Pathways Steering Committee and the Director of Parks and Rec have recently weighed in to acknowledge their continued support of these actions. And Cal Atlantic has worked diligently with the city to facilitate where we are tonight. City Council's review uh, of the draft ordinance covers three actions. One, it will convey the city's interest in approximately 12 acres of land, uh, more commonly known as stormwater ponds one through four, to Cal Atlantic. Two, accept the transfer of approximately 54.2 acres of land from Cal Atlantic for the creation of a new public area. And three, to join in an agreement with Cal Atlantic uh, for the continued maintenance of the existing red, blue, and green trails with the newly established public area coming to the city. Uh, the last one, just to make it a little bit more clear, uh, we are granting or, or requiring Cal Atlantic or eventually the HOA to continue the maintenance of these trails. For the first item, City Council is required to hold a public hearing prior to acting on the attached ordinance to convey the city's interest in the 11.7 acres of land. Stormwater facilities within residential neighborhoods are commonly held and maintained by HOAs. This would be no different. Uh, while City Council approved the subdivision plats that originally conveyed the ponds to the city in 2004 and 5, the proffers again envision long-term maintenance of these facilities going to the HOA. 
staff, Cal Atlantic, and the Homeowners Association have all worked together and understand what's happening here tonight. Uh, and all are on board to facilitate this transfer. Approval of the draft ordinance directs the city manager to sign the draft deed of subdivision and easement and the draft subdivision plat on your behalf, which together create the transfer, create and transfer ponds one through four to Cal Atlantic. For number two, the acceptance of new public area. The city currently holds ownership to about 175 acres in this planning area, planning area three. Over 150 acres connect directly to the proposed new public area in areas one and two. The proposed public area is bordered by the VCR trail and continue, contains established trail systems within the village of Idlewild. As noted on the attached Parks and Rec memo and the Pathway Steering Committee memo, public ownership of areas one and two provides the opportunity to connect additional trails to the historic site containing the Downman House and into Altoona subdivision, which is not currently connected to any pedestrian facilities. Additionally, ownership of the wooded land assists the city council's goals to maintain its urban tree canopy through 2020 and 2021 and beyond while protecting riparian buffers along North Hazel Run. Under the Code of Virginia, unless it is already shown on the adopted master plan, no park or public area shall be established or authorized unless the general location or approximate location has been approved by the Planning Commission as being substantially in accord with the adopted comprehensive plan. On May 10th, following the close of a public hearing at which there were no speakers, the Planning Commission approved the attached resolution finding the proposed public area to be in accord with the 2015 comp plan. Prior to the transfer of areas one and two to the city, ponds five through seven and the, buffer, and the tree buffer areas one through five will be subdivided out and held in ownership by Cal Atlantic until accepted by the Homeowners Association. Approval of the draft ordinance directs the city manager to sign the draft deed of subdivision accepting parcels A1 and B1 as shown on the attached plaque. And the last item, item number three regarding trail, the trail maintenance agreement. Uh, the existing trail network within areas one through four are intended to be maintained by Cal Atlantic and ultimately the homeowners association pursuant to proffer number two. The draft trail maintenance agreement, which was provided at your seats tonight, establishes the framework for the permitted access, use, and maintenance of these trails. Uh, one of the, or the, actually the president of the Homeowners Association is a member of the Planning Commission and, and made sure to note that this is already budgeted uh, into their budget for next year. Uh, they understand uh, what the acceptance of these, of the maintenance responsibilities means and, and expect to continue to do so uh, for the future. Approval of the draft ordinance directs the city manager to sign the draft trail maintenance agreement permitting access, use, and signing responsibility for the maintenance of the red, blue, and green nature trails to Cal Atlantic and ultimately the Homeowners Association. Costs associated with the acceptance and maintenance of the undeveloped land in areas one and two are minimal. Full, de full development of the property into active recreational amenities would be evaluated in future capital improvements plans. But the city will experience a savings of approximately $12,000 a year for the uh, release of the maintenance responsibilities for ponds one through four as a result of the transfer to Cal Atlantic and ultimately the Homeowners Association. Uh, additionally, I wanted to point out that since the open space parcels are not taxed, there will be no loss in tax revenue with the proposed transfer. Therefore, staff recommends approval of the attached ordinance on first read Second read would be, if you acted tonight, second read would be scheduled for June 13th, 2017. I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Ms. Sherman. Are there any questions for Ms. Sherman? Yes, Vice Mayor uh, Withers. I'd just like to thank Ms. Sherman for answering all my questions tonight. I think she <laughs> knew we're, that were coming, so she, she was graciously has answered those uh, with the tax uh, deal. Thank you very much, Amari, for, for working with me today and make, uh, letting me understand what all this was about. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? This is a public hearing. If there's anyone here who would like to speak to this matter, please approach the podium and give your name and address. All right, then I will declare the public hearing closed. This matter, yes, Ms. Sherman. Before you vote on it, I would like to make uh, you aware of one thing. Uh, Mr. Ekstrom, the assistant city attorney, just pointed out that on the attached ordinance in the third paragraph of section one, uh, it's currently written 
to require Cal Atlantic and its successors to be responsible for the maintenance of existing and future trails on the open space land. Um, it should only reference existing trails. Any future trails would be subject to maintenance by the city. So if you act on this tonight, please note that change and, and we'll make that correction for second right. read. Thank you, Mr. X. Madam Mayor, I'll move the ordinance on first read that is amended. All right. Motion's been made and seconded. Any discussion? Please cast your votes. Motion passes 7 0. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Um, we have no one signed up to speak before us tonight for item number six. Um, does any councilor wish to place a matter before us for the, on the council agenda? <coughs> then we will go to cons uh, Council Fry. Uh, MLK Bridge Ceremony. Mm -hmm. That's what I like to add. It's on the calendar. Yeah, I just want to uh, throw it you out Want there. to remind folks of yes, it? Yes, indeed. And it is what date? Uh, June 3rd. June 3rd. Uh, 10 a.m. At, at 10 a.m. At what's the name of the new park, Mr. At Snowden Park. Snowden Park on Fall Hill Avenue. I, just, yeah, I know it's on our calendar. I just want to make sure the public knew. Yes. Well, it's good to remind the public. Thank you. Um, is, does any councilor wish to remove an item from the consent agenda? Madam Mayor, I move the consent agenda submitted. Second. Please cast your votes. Motion passes 7 0. We have before us the meeting calendar for fiscal year 2018, which we need to adopt. It includes um, no meeting the second. Tuesday, the fourth Tuesday in in July, and the. Madam Mayor, I think we just approved yeah. that as an item on the consent agenda. Oh, <laughs> you are so correct. I turned my agenda over. <laughs> it was at the top of the page. My apologies to the council and to the public. Item nine: We have before us four sets of minutes: February twenty eighth, March twenty, March seventh. And the public hearings May 9th and the regular session May 9th. Are there any additions or corrections to the minutes? Madam Mayor, move approval of the minutes as submitted. Second. Please cast your votes. Vice Mayor Withers. Vice, Vice Mayor Withers. <laughs> Motion passes 7 0. <laughs> you didn't Thank see that. Thank you. <laughs> Senior Mo. Um, Mr. We will call upon Mr. Baruti for the city manager's update. Thank you, Madam Mayor, members of council. Just uh, quickly highlight uh, some activities over the past week and, and future activities. I uh, want to say thank you to the Marine Corps for again hosting uh, an exceptional uh, half uh, um, Marine Corps marathon here in the city. We were delighted to see uh, more than 6,000 folks finish, including some folks at this uh, dais. Uh, we're delighted to see uh, great activity, great fun um, up and close. Uh, folks, uh, again, some 6,000 ran and seven, almost 500 ran what they called the Double Dog Dare, which is not only a half marathon, but a half marathon plus a five miler. So those folks are uh, obviously super athletes. We're delighted to have them in the city. I do want to thank neighbors for, for their patience uh, while folks wind themselves through the streets. Um, and again, thank the Marine Corps for throwing what uh, was an exceptional 10th uh, run through our city. Hope uh, um, they're, they're start planning for next year. Obviously, we want to help to support them do that. I'll also highlight the fact that uh, Parks and Rec again has their Kids Fishing Derby on Saturday, June 3rd at Mott's Reservoir. That's a free event beginning at 7.30 a.m. again, June 3rd. Remind folks to join us for that uh, great adventure. And lastly, I'll just highlight the fact that uh, the City Council and the Mayor will take their vision on the road. We've got uh, three planned meetings with the community. Uh, June 7th will be at Dorothy Hart at 7 p.m. Um, we'll also be uh, uh, on June 10th um, at Mayfield. Um, and lastly, on uh, June 12th, Monday at 7 p.m. will be at Idlewild Community Center. So again, June 7th at 7 p.m., Dorothy Hart. Saturday, May, I'm sorry, June 10th at 9 a.m. at Mayfield uh, Civic, uh, I'm sorry, at the park at, at Mayfield. Uh, as well as uh, the last event, uh, Monday, June 12th, 7 p.m., Idlewide Community Center. So 
uh, that information will be dispersed in, in many ways. I just wanted to highlight it uh, for the uh, uh, um, residents' attention early on. So thank you, Madam Mayor. Happy to take any questions. Any questions for Mr. Baruti? All right. I, I would like to add that we have a Memorial Day weekend coming up here, and we have a remarkable community with many, many reminders, cemeteries, uh, the Statue of Hugh Mercer on Washington Avenue, many reminders of those who sacrificed their lives, literally, for our sake and for this country. We will have a beautiful, the annual illumination at the Fred Fredericksburg National Cemetery Saturday night. On Memorial Day itself, there is a ceremony at the Confederate Cemetery in the morning. There is a cer ceremony at the National Cemetery at noon. There is the Memorial Day pr procession from Sophia um, uh, at 11, a Memorial Day ceremony at the War Memorial at 2, the, the Memorial to fall Fallen Heroes that the our Veterans Council um, has there in front of Mari, and a free Pops Orchestra concert at 6 p.m. So we have many ways to remember those folks who, dedicate, who literally sacrificed their lives for us um, on this Memorial Day weekend. And if there's nothing more to come before this body, we are adjourned.